As Israel's decades-old occupation of Palestinian territory grinds on, commerce and economics are becoming new battle lines. An embargo, the latest weapon of resistance for Gaza and the West Bank. But how does an internationally supported boycott movement deal with local vested interests? A few cartons of spilt milk and some trampled groceries might not seem like much of a response to decades of illegal occupation. But this small demonstration last month in the Palestinian city of Ramallah was significant. It was the moment Palestinians officially boycotted Israeli products for the first time in two decades. <laughs> The idea of a boycott isn't new. Activists around the world have been urging an embargo of Israeli companies for decades. But the hails of worldwide condemnation during Israel's ferocious assault on Gaza last summer galvanized the movement known as Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, or BDS. Israel has an Achilles heel. Omar Barghouti is one of the leaders of BDS, which is using simple market economics to force an end to the occupation of Palestinian lands. Israel has a vulnerability point that we've discovered. Despite its massive power and despite massive complicity in the West, Israel cannot fight a nonviolent movement like ours that's winning hearts and minds. Israel has an advanced market economy, which is heavily reliant on both export earnings and foreign investment. BDS believes that a hard-hitting international boycott, similar to the one that pressured South Africa's apartheid regime, will force Israel and its Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, to take peace seriously. In June 2013, uh, Israel started viewing the BDS movement as a strategic threat to its regime. Uh, uh, Netanyahu started attacking BDS, second only to the so-called Iranian nuclear threat. But curiously, although the boycott movement is gathering pace outside Israel, within the occupied territories, it's been slow to take off. The supermarkets of the West Bank and Gaza still display a wide range of Israeli-made goods. And that, says one Israeli economist, is no accident. When we're talking about the economic relations between uh, Israel and the Palestinian territory, the most important issue is the Paris Accord signed in April of 1994. Israel uh, has control over the flow of uh, labor, over the flow of goods, and over taxation uh, to a very high degree. Uh, and in effect, uh, that allowed Israel to completely strangulate the Palestinian economy. No petrol in the gas stations. No food in the supermarkets, no, no water in the tap, because everything is controlled by Israel. So now the Palestinian economy has become a captive market for Israeli goods, uh, and uh, the international uh, aid is keeping the Palestinians uh, more or less alive, more or less surviving uh, under, under conditions of occupation, uh, while uh, Israel continues to control the economy and uh, call the shots. As this poster makes clear, there are stark consequences for that dependency. Buying Israeli products pays for the bullets that kill Palestinians. The boycott began modestly, targeting the six biggest Israeli food industry imports. But former Palestinian Authority Minister Mazen Sunukrat, who imports one of the banned products, thinks the embargo has been unfairly applied. 
if you look at the whole portfolio of these six companies, they are less than $50 million a year in the in Palestinian territories. Out of five billion of imports from Israel, it's very, very, very little. It's a try, it's an idea, but I think it should have been managed in a much more professional way than dumping the products in the hearts of the cities. So Nokra imported Strauss ice cream to the West Bank and is one of the six Palestinian business people who are sales agents for the now boycotted Israeli goods. At least from the company I'm representing, it's a Unilever entity. Unilever is a British Dutch company and they have an official letter from the head office from London saying that the company of producing ice cream in Akko, north of Israel, is owned 100% by Unilever Global. And Unilever Global uh, actually is very much annoyed that an international global company have been put on, on a boycott list. The boycott committee ruled the products were made in Israel, but had been sold by the Israeli owners to a British-Dutch company to circumvent a boycott. Next on the list, says BDS, are Palestinians who are considered economic collaborators. We're targeting them by exposing those ventures, those uh, business ventures. Uh, we haven't yet called for a boycott of a, a, a Palestinian business uh, uh, enterprise that's in, invested in Israel, but we're very close to that point. In fact, we're debating it at this point within the BDS National Committee, which leads the global BDS movement. BDS believes targeting Palestinian economic collaborators will increase the impact of a campaign that already has many in Israel worried. Inside Israel, almost everybody knows about the boycott movement, understands the boycott movement and its goals, and uh, has some kind of idea of how it already started to affect Israeli society. In 2011, there was a conference of 80 of Israel's biggest millionaires and billionaires, and they um, wanted to, to discuss the danger of the, of the boycott movement, and they w came up with a press release at the end where they called the government, please continue the peace process somehow or, or make some kind of compromise with the Palestinians because otherwise we are headed towards the situation of South Africa under the days of apartheid. The government did not heed that call and many of these millionaires and billionaires have chosen to leave Israel or to shift many of their investments outside of Israel. While Israeli commercial interests have been waking up to the threat of boycott and have other options, Palestinians, like this traditional cooking pot manufacturer, say they have no choice but to keep Israeli links open. This business employs 50 people. 60% of its products are sold to Israeli kitchens, hotels and cafeterias. The only external market it can reach. Resources are controlled by Israelis. Our water, our electricity, our movement, our uh, borders. How you can create like a kind of economy while all these obstacles surrounding your economical life. As long as we have occupation, let's say there's no viable economy. It's, it's very clear. Pinar Dairy in Ramallah is one of many modern West Bank enterprises. While a boycott would allow Pinar to gain market share from its Israeli competitors, its boss understands that Israel's ability to choke the flow of goods from the factory to the market can block all growth. In total, we're talking about 40% uh, is controlled by us and 60% is controlled by the Israelis. The company sells its products across the West Bank, and though getting them into Gaza is problematic, since Israel controls the roads, sales went through the roof during last summer's war because patriotic Palestinians refused to buy Israeli goods. During the uh, Gaza war, I, I can remember that the, the demand went up by 30 to 40 percent immediately. And one of Pinar's main Israeli competitors is already feeling the pinch. אני מתחיל להרגיש את זה בקטנה, אבל כרגע זה עוד לא נאכף בצורה מסודרת שם, ככה הבנתי. יכול להיות שזה ישפיע. של ההשפעה של המכירות במגזר הפלסטיני, 
אם זה לאורך זמן, אנחנו עוד לא יודעים, כי זה רק עכשיו אה, אה, יצא כל הקול הזה וכל הסערה הזאת. ימים יגידו, זה מה שאני יכול להגיד. ימים יגידו. אף אחד לא יודע מה, מה יהיו התוצאות של המהלך הזה. הייתי מאוד שמח להמשיך למכור בשוק הזה ולהמשיך לגדול, ואולי אפילו ל- 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 לייצא פעם למדינות ערב. זה חלום. But all this begs a question. The boycott is meant to target Israeli produce, originating in illegal settlements. So why isn't it more effective? Part of the answer can be found in an Israeli agricultural settlement, deep in the occupied Jordan Valley. It should be a prime target for any boycott. But when these boxes of the famous Mejdul dates arrive on store shelves, their roots in an illegal settlement will either be invisible because their country of origin label is missing or duplicious because many falsely declare made in Palestine. This deliberate mislabeling is a common practice, say Palestinian date farmers. It's how their Israeli competitors and foreign retailers are getting around consumer unease about goods grown and manufactured on confiscated land. من مستوطنات في الأراضي الفلسطينية بكراتين أو بصرديق مكتوب عليها تمور الأقصى تمور الحرمين تمور البلاد المقدسة يختاروا دائما تسميات توحي بأن هذا التمر عربي حتى يغزو بهذه المسميات وبهذه العلامات التجارية يغزو الأسواق العربية والإسلامية وعندما بدأت عمليات مقاطعة لإنتاج المستوطنات لجأوا إلى هذه الطريقة وطبعا زوروا وزيفوا وطبعوا على كراتينهم إنتاج فلسطيني أو صنع في فلسطين هناك عدد قليل جدا من التجار الفلسطينيين والعرب اللي يعني باعوا ضميرهم ساين وراء الربح وغطوا على محاولات التزوير في المستوطنات الإسرائيلية المقامة في الأراضي الفلسطينية. 60% of all Majul dates grown by Israeli companies actually come from the occupied Jordan Valley. So actually when, when anybody sees a date which says made in Israel, in a, in a supermarket or, or anywhere in the world, um, there is a very large chance, the, the most likely, it comes from the illegal colonies, even if it doesn't say so on the packaging. I've seen uh, how these companies lie about their packaging, not just by writing made in Palestine. This is especially done if they want to sell uh, these products in Arab countries. Then they, they make their customers believe as if this is actually Palestinian dates. Uh, and that's uh, another form of exploitation. They're exploiting the Palestinian identity. Misleading labeling is about more than deceiving consumers. Under European Union regulations, Israeli agricultural produce pays no import taxes, giving it a major advantage in a huge export market. But this doesn't apply to Israeli farm products from illegal settlements. For us, Israeli products have duty-free access to the EU, to our, to our markets. Settlement products do not qualify for that preferential access. It's as simple as that. So we have two ways of looking at this. One is the rules of origin, you know, where obviously you know, this is an important part of policy that determines trade relations. The other is labeling, where there's also been, on the voluntary level, at the national level, labeling for products which is produced in settlements. So it clearly stipulates where products are actually made. 
the European Union officials refuse to use that word boycott. The interesting thing is that even though this position is um, uh, moving at a, at a snail's pace uh, and all these sanctions are mostly theoretical at this point, uh, there have been various um, uh, regulations put on, on paper, but uh, so far Israel has been allowed to just lie and get around these regulations and, and call products from the colonies products from Israel in order to avoid um, facing any consequences. But authentic Palestinian date growers are also trying to make their way into this rigged market. Zuhair Manasra runs a $16 million date plantation near Jericho. It produces 500 tons annually, but in the years ahead, he hopes to boost production to 3,000 tons. But he lacks sufficient water. Manasura's future rests on the whim of the occupying power, which the boycott movement is trying its best to rein in. Back in Ramallah, the working capital of the Palestinian Authority, government officials are both waiting to see the effects of the boycott and keen to explain why they cannot fully take part in it. You know, we have a political problem with the Israelis. They come here and they occupy our land. They steal our natural resources. The water that we buy uh, is water that they've taken from the West Bank. They take our water from the West Bank and resell it back to us at a higher price than they sell it to Israelis. Uh, electricity comes from Israel. Our gas comes from Israel. And, and these things that we have to buy from them in order to survive. But whatever we don't need from them uh, in order to survive, we don't because they're our occupying power. And, and, um, and it's, if they uh, are not willing to recognize us as, as humans, they're not willing to recognize us as a country, they're not willing to recognize our national sovereignty over our own territory, then uh, we're not going to buy any goods from them. The structure of Palestinian economic dependency on Israel was erected in the years following the 1967 war and entrenched by the 1995 economic agreements known as the Paris Protocols. Under the Paris Protocol, uh, we're limited in what we do. For example, we can buy electricity from Jordan 10 times cheaper than we can buy it from Israel, but this is not allowed. There's a lot of agreements that we, um, that we signed, which uh, I think uh, after years and years, you realize that you've made mistakes in signing them or you didn't negotiate the fine prints. There are few better examples of how restrictions are selectively applied than the Ramallah and Rawabi sewage plants. The Ramallah city government supports the boycott, but has spent years trying to build a new sewage plant, only to be frustrated by the Israeli bureaucracy. But less than 20 kilometers away, the yet-to-be-completed city of Rawabi, which some in the boycott movement criticize for working too closely with the Israelis, already has all sewage arrangements in place. The brainchild of returned Palestinian developer Bashar al-Masri, Rawabi is the single biggest investment project in Palestine, built with Palestinian and Qatari money. I thought I was one of tens of thousands that would be coming back. Um, unfortunately, um, I was disappointed to find out that I'm one of um, maximum 100 that came back as investors. The new city is meant to house up to 40,000 Palestinians. Three schools, a medical center, a shopping mall, a mosque and church are almost completed. Ruwabi's developers worked closely with the Israelis to obtain building materials, permits and water lines. This, critics say, normalizes the occupation. Uh, look, I'm in construction. They, they criticize us for buying Israeli products. 80% of our products, we have no choice anyway. So cement, for example, cement we buy from the Palestinian, uh, own, uh, Palestinian Authority owned company, and at least 85-90% of their cement comes from Israel, and it has to come from Israel. Well, I'm not advocating that they boycott. On the contrary, I think we're in for the long haul. If you believe in a two-state solution, that means you believe in economic cooperation. So I think it is hypocritical to um, advocate 
otherwise. It comes as no surprise that there are some Palestinians who are not happy with the call for boycott. The Israeli occupation has a system of VIP cards, very important people cards, and uh, some Palestinians who are able to obtain these cards uh, are able to cross through the checkpoint more easily, uh, access the, uh, Israel in order to speak, to, to meet with Israeli business people and, and make deals with them. For them, of course, prospects of losing these privileges uh, is, is uh, dour. They would rather not uh, lose these privileges, and, and that's understandable. But some Palestinian businessmen support the boycott. They say occasional deals with the Israelis may be necessary, but the continued occupation makes a long-term relationship unsustainable. Israel controls every single strategic economic asset to the Palestinian economy, whether it's move, movement, access, trade, electricity, water, uh, telecommunication frequencies, airspace, you name it. If it has to do with building a state-like economy, it is being micromanaged by the Israeli side. And every once in a while, the Israeli side drops some crumbs of those economic assets into the Palestinian economy, and we do the best that we can with those crumbs. But they are nowhere near the amount of resources required to build a proper economy. I actually think that some of the larger companies or larger investors in Palestine that have uh, deep ties with Israel, I don't think they do it fully willingly. I think the Palestinian capitalist class understands very well that their future depends on being able to be a capitalist, capitalist class in a sovereign economy, not a capitalist class which is subservient to an Israeli military occupation. <laughs> Muniba Masri was one of the first Palestinian industrialists to support the peace process and invest heavily in the nascent Palestinian economy. He is popularly known as the richest man in Palestine. He has little sympathy with those who object to the boycott. From 1999 to 2015, we have seen a lot of things. We've, seen, we've been fooled by the Israelis to say we have a peace process. So, it, it was a, a really putting a lot of smoke in our eyes, and we were not smart enough to realize this before then. I believe very much in the popular movement. I believe in to boycott, to boycott all the Israeli product until we have our independence, and then we talk. I believe in what the BDS is doing. I think they're doing a great job, and I think they're doing it right. And this is a form of resistance. One of the most famous symbols of resistance is the defiance that takes place every week in the village Belayin, 12 miles west of Ramallah. A now ritualized clash of slogans, stones, bullets and tear gas that reminds the world of the realities of occupation faced by Palestinians. For the vast majority of Palestinians, that is not the case. For the vast majority of Palestinians, uh, the occupation is a, a daily reality which makes uh, their lives very difficult and which makes their economic development absolutely impossible. They have made a choice that their dignity and that their freedom comes before their economic prosperity. The BDS movement is not some ivory tower group here or there. It's the absolute largest coalition in Palestinian society. That gives us a lot of power because we have near consensus behind the BDS movement. That power we're leveraging to pressure businesses and to expose their complicity. With the Israelis so implacable, change isn't going to happen overnight. But now, many Palestinians are taking the boycott seriously, even if their capacity to take part is limited by the very occupation they want brought to an end.